Renaissance Italy was marked by both continuous warfare and economic growth. Against this backdrop arose the condotta, the contract system of hiring mercenaries, which was arguably the most distinct characteristic of the period. Initially, soldiers hired themselves out to the highest bidder as free lances. The lance being the smallest unit of army organization at the time. This is the origin of the modern term freelancer. However, these soldiers soon formed entire mercenary companies, led by elected leaders such as John Hawkwood, who were seen as first among equals. The powerful and wealthy Italian cities, enriched by their monopoly on maritime trade with the East, could easily hire these companies, but they soon learned that doing so often brought more problems than they had bargained for. Known as free companies or great companies, these mercenary groups saw themselves as independent, self-governing adventurers, always on the lookout for the most lucrative offer. A rich Italian city, they soon realized, was a worthwhile target to plunder. It was not long until they would become the bane of Italy. In this video, we investigate the phenomenon of free companies and how they were eventually replaced by the arguably more famous mercenary captains, the condottieri. Let's start at the beginning. By the mid-12th century, medieval Europe had become increasingly urbanized. The climate was warming, allowing for better harvests, and forests were cleared, making room for fields of barley, emmer and wheat to help feed the growing population, especially in the many urban centers. It was against this backdrop that the paid military service of infantrymen gradually became an increasingly important factor in warfare. Urbanization led to better fortifications of cities and more castles, and thus to the proliferation of siege warfare. These new siege specialists often offered their service for pay rather than fulfilling other military obligations. Infantry was also needed to serve as long-term garrison troops of border castles. As the historian Michael Mallet put it, quote, all pointed toward a growing role of infantry in the warfare of the day." End quote. Not everybody liked this change. Many denounced these new infantrymen as brigands and outlaws, because they tended to harass travelers and merchants in the absence of other lucrative economic opportunities. Over the course of the 12th century, these infantrymen formed distinct bands called routiers or routiers, from the word ruta or route, meaning band or small group. While this term is most closely associated with the Hundred Years' War, the phenomenon of routiers is actually quite a bit older. One famous example is the Brabansons, who were most active from 1166 to 1214. According to the German historian Julia Knödler, the Brabansons were in the business of spreading fear and terror. They were deployed to wage an economic war on enemy territory, brutally ravaging the countryside and destroying resources to force the enemy to surrender. Their destructive raids and plundering in Europe led the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa and King of France Louis VII to sign a pact in 1167, forbidding the use of mercenaries. And even the church prohibited mercenaries in the Third Lateran Council in 1179. Despite these bans, the Brabassons always found new employers. Even in Frederick Barbarossa himself, who in 1175 hired them for his Italy campaign. Unlike most peasant infantry, who were mobilized based on feudal obligations, their pay enabled them to equip themselves handsomely with male armor and helmets. They were experienced fighters who usually relied on pearl weapons, long pikes and knives. Over time, the crossbow gained popularity among routiers, especially after the Crusades. The increased firepower led many armies to deploy numbers of archers and crossbowmen. This demand led to new supply, with many Pisans, Venetians and Genoese offering their services abroad as crossbowmen. The new missile firepower was directed against both enemy knights and infantry, which led to new defensive methods. In Italy, for instance, infantry units were divided into pikemen and shield-bearers. With the shield-bearer resting their long shields on the ground to provide protection for both the pikemen and the crossbowmen. This new need for protection also led to changes in the cavalry division. The historian Michael Mallet explains, quote, The new threat from crossbow bolts led to the gradual replacement of leather and male armor by plate armor for cavalry. It also provoked concern for the protection of horses and the introduction of horse armor, end quote. With this change came an increased need for spare horses to replace those slain in battle or exhausted from bearing the weight of the new armor and equipment. Cavalry now required assistance from a small group of pages and archers, 
to lead the horses and provide covering fire. Mallet notes, quote, out of these needs grew the cavalry lance, the small group of men attached to the armored men-at-arms, which was to become the characteristic formation of late medieval cavalry, end quote. The effectiveness of this new combination of pikemen, crossbowmen and knightly cavalry was vividly demonstrated in the 1289 Battle of Campaldino, a clash between pro-papal and pro-imperial forces known respectively as Guelphs and Ghibellines, and represented here in blue and red. Both armies consisted mostly of feudal and communal forces, with small groups of routiers coming from various countries. The Ghibellines launched the first charge, committing the first two lines of cavalry and the infantry to the fight. They succeeded in pushing back the Guelph advance guard, forcing the main Guelph cavalry force to slowly give ground. The battle hung in the balance, with the Ghibellines maintaining momentum until the Guelph forces were pushed back to their line of carts, which served as a reserve and rallying point. At this stage, the bulk of the Ghibelline army found itself overextended. Quickly, the Guelph infantry, many of them crossbowmen, pushed up on the flanks. Caught in the crossfire from both sides, the Ghibelline reserve panicked and fled, while the Guelph reserve swept around the flanks and came in on the center rear of the trapped enemy. The coordinated efforts of knights, crossbowmen and pikemen secured a decisive victory for the Guelphs. Routiers were employed in a manner similar to the Battle of Campaldino throughout Europe during this time, but their prevalence gradually declined between 1250 and 1330. This is usually attributed to a general resistance against them. For example, much like the Pact of Frederick Barbarossa or the Papal Ban, the Magna Carta of 1215 included clauses prohibiting the use of mercenaries. Other historians ascribe the decline of the routiers to the long domestic peace in France or changes in warfare, such as the ever heavier cavalry, which, at least on certain occasions, slaughtered entire routier formations. Whatever the reason, the phenomenon did not reappear prominently until the beginning of the Hundred Years' War in 1337, when the routiers became increasingly known as free companies. In January of 1340, Edward III of England proclaimed himself King of France and later invaded French territory to assert his claim to the throne. This kicked off the first major campaign of the Hundred Years' War. The initial phase of the war was characterized by mounted cavalry raids called chevaux chies. Like the aforementioned Brabazon strategy of raiding and pillaging, the English raids on French territories were meant to weaken the enemy economy and the French confidence in their king. Edward III even allowed some of these plunderers to form somewhat autonomous bands, which became a real nuisance for the French. To make matters worse, France lost two major battles, first at Crecy in 1346 and then at Poitiers in 1356. According to the historian Nicolas Savy, these losses prompted mercenary bands to exploit the king's vulnerability and, quote, Edward III's resolve to further weaken France in order to intensify their marauding by ruining crops extorting money from the rural populations and forcing entire villages to pay them protection money. In 1360, the first phase of the war ended with the Peace of Bretigny. This treaty mandated the transfer of numerous castles and other territories between the English and the French, which led to a significant number of people being uprooted and routier armies terrorizing the French countryside. As many of them were mounted, they could travel great distances, strike quickly and leave before the local royal forces could react. The fragmented French forces, weakened by war and generally unorganized, couldn't mount an adequate response. Unlike the Brabançons, the routiers of the Hundred Years' War were experts in mounted raids, but also adopted English tactics from the Battle of Crecy and Poitiers. More heavily equipped men, often dismounted, and formed the infantry line, while archers forced the enemy to attack. In the writings of many historians, the band of routiers begin to be referred to as free companies, starting from the 1360s. The historian Kenneth Fowler explains that a company consisted of groups of routiers who banded together. The individual groups from different regions and countries retained their identity, but chose to combine their strength because plundering and pillaging was much more lucrative and safer when carried out by large bands. As the historian Michael Mallet notes, quote, for foreigners in a strange land, the larger the band, the better." End quote. Primary sources describe these companies in Latin as gens sine capite, literally people without a head, meaning they had no leader. Obviously, they had a leader in name, but he was elected and seen as the first among equals. 
It is commonly assumed that the name Free Company was meant as a deliberate rejection of feudalism, or at least the hierarchical structure of medieval society. However, there seems to be a controversy among historians on this point. At least part of this perspective emerged later and may be somewhat anachronistic. What is clear is that those who did not plunder France on their own soon found employment in the various conflicts including the War of Breton Succession, the Franco-Navarrese War, the feud between the Counts of Foix and Armanac in the southwest of France and after 1364, the war in Castile. Historian Nicolas Savi notes that in the early 1360s, plundering by the free companies was at its height and that they formed veritable armies consisting of thousands of men. As these increasingly vast and powerful companies rose to prominence, they and others soon adopted the term Great Companies. In 1360, the German Albert Stetz, who had fought in the English army, formed a company of mercenaries with other demobilized soldiers of fortune, such as the Englishman John Hawkwood. It was known as Great Company, but it wasn't the only group that bore that name. Most people associate the Great Companies with either the Sturz Hawkwood group, which would come to be known as White Company or the Hundred Years' War in general. However, it was not the English who first formed such companies. Already in 1302, the German-Italian Roger de Flor commanded the Catalan Great Company, a few thousand strong, on a spectacular campaign from Italy to Byzantium. There, they first defeated many Turkish Beyliks, then the Byzantine Emperor himself, and finally established their own small state in Greece. In Italy, great companies were already in existence in the 1340s under the Swabian knight Werner of Urslingen, and later in the 1350s under the Italian known as Fra Moriale. Only in 1361 would a great company mainly composed of Englishmen move to Italy. Initially, it was just known as the English Company, but later it was called White Company. The White Company was made famous by the adventure story of the same name by Arthur Conan Doyle. The historical company was later led by John Hawkwood, who was dubbed the most sought-after mercenary captain in Renaissance Italy. All these companies have fascinating stories, each meriting their very own video, so that's what we're going to do. Here, we'll just refer to them as examples in the general history of the great companies. Most of the famous great companies had at least one thing in common. At some point, they tried their luck in Italy. There were various reasons for this. One major motivating factor for the Germans, French and English was the bad economic situation in their homelands. In the 1340s and 50s, trade and harvests were severely impacted by the fallout from the Black Death, which had just ravaged large stretches of Europe. Famine was at an all-time high and war was more common than peace. Italy was just as affected by the Black Death as any other region, but it had a few economic advantages. As Michael Mallet puts it, quote, Italy lay at the heart of the commercial revolution of the 13th century and at the heart of the expanding money economy, end quote. The wealth of cities like Genoa, Florence and Venice provided the necessary capital to finance entire mercenary companies. This economic expansion slowly led to more conflicts with neighboring city-states and an increased need for armed forces. Space and resources were limited in Italy, and the lucrative trade routes from the east increasingly became the target of ever more competitive cities and merchants. Proto-Renaissance Italy also saw the rise of banking, which provided funds and credits for the growing merchant economies, and was also a profitable target for the great companies. Many mercenary companies simply traveled through Italy, wandering into territory of city-states and forcing the Italians to pay them to wander back out again. Historian P. W. Singer aptly notes that in the 1340s and the 1350s, the great company of Werner of Urslingen basically, quote, ran an Italian-wide protection racket, end quote. It didn't help that Italian cities were rarely unified in their responses to the mercenary companies. In fact, they tended to be factionalized, with nobles fighting their own local rivalries, furiously disagreeing on communal politics and economics. This fragmented and disunified response partially explains why the Italian city-states could not do much against the great companies. William Carfero, an expert on Renaissance Italy and mercenaries, also points to the simple fact that the great companies outnumbered the forces of city-states. Werner of Urslingen, for example, had 10,000 men, while the English army at Agincourt only numbered six to 9,000 men. 
A small Italian city-state that had just been decimated by the Black Death could muster far fewer men than that. Even if the Italian cities managed to defeat the great companies, they usually just split up into small bands that remained in the region and redirected their efforts toward plundering the countryside. So, while paying them off was a sensible solution, that approach only served to attract more mercenaries. The same fact that brought so many mercenary companies to Italy also ultimately led to their demise. The growing Italian economy produced powerful states like 14th century Venice, Genoa, Milan and Florence. They developed a more coherent and centralized political organization, which inevitably led to a greater emphasis on permanent defense. Eventually, the companies could not survive against the growing military strength of the states. The wealth that had drawn them to Italy in the first place, and had fed and nurtured them throughout the 1360s, 70s and 80s, was ultimately their downfall. The mercenaries themselves, however, would continue to be active in Italy, albeit in a different way. For example, John Hawkwood, the leader of the White Company, became increasingly attached to the state of Florence in his later years. Michael Mallet notes, quote, Not only was the position of the mercenary captain, the condottiere, now recognized, but the process of attaching him to the state had begun, end quote. The Italian Alberigo da Barbiano is usually considered the first condottiero, while his company is seen as the last of the great companies. However, Hawkwood was also around for another 15 years, and the companies would operate in Italy for the remainder of the 14th century. Nonetheless, Hawkwood and da Barbiano do represent a change in mercenaryism. The gradual evolution from the companies to the mercenary captain, the condottiero. The term comes from the Italian word condotta, meaning contract. Contracts had also been used by the free companies, but the primary sources show a clear change. In the 14th century, many members of free companies would sign the condotta, but in the 15th century, only the name of the captain, the condottiero, appeared and he alone received the money. The condottieri also relied on mercenaries, but they used state funds to recruit, commission, train and then lead them into battle. Under these mercenary captains, the routier groups that had made up the free companies became gradually less important. The gens sine capite, the people without a leader, became followers of a leader. The condottiero was no longer the first among equals, but a general. Soon the condottieri would be exalted by artists and writers, admired by their employers and feared by their enemies. In the 15th century, they acquired entire duchies and asserted a claim to greatness. The 15th century would mark the beginning of the age of the condottieri. Thank you for watching this video. Just as a reminder, we uploaded a few updates about our teaching experience at the university on our Patreon page. At the moment, we teach a seminar about history on YouTube. If you do want to support us, Patreon is the best way, but recently we also enabled donations here on YouTube, so that's now a possibility, if you prefer that. As mentioned before, we try to become less dependent on sponsors, so if you like our content, please consider donating.